Today, we are tackling algorithms, but not in the way you'd expect. No yawn-inducing powerpoints and no tedious lectures. We are talking pancakes, parties, chess matches. Real life stuff, this is about uncovering the secrets of algorithms in the most fun and relatable way possible. Without getting bored for even a second, we will learn the following things. The fundamentals of algorithms and data structures, how to measure performance, and how a few specific algorithms work, such as the one used to beat the world champion of chess. But before we get into all that, <laughs> I'm starving, so I will make us some pancakes. Let's dive into the art of creating the fluffiest pancakes you've ever tasted. Flour into a sieve that helps to make the batter nice and smooth. Add a pinch of salt and infuse with cloud-like baking powder. That's our secret to make the fluffiest pancakes ever. Then we need some sugar for that sweetness that we need for our pancakes. Set that aside as we work on our wet ingredients now. Start with our pool of fresh cold milk and crack an egg into it. A golden sun in a milky sky. Beautiful. Now add a stream of cool melted butter. Its aroma filling the air. Oh, to die for. And to top it all off, let's just use a hint of vanilla, a drop of pure essence. Next up, combine the dry and wet ingredients to bring it all to life. Now let's just give it a quick whisk to transform it into a cloudy, creamy dream. Now bring heat to our metal cast iron pan, just put a drop a spoonful and let it spread nice and evenly. Make sure your pancake is golden and fluffy before you flip it. And once the pancake is bubbling, give it a good flip. And here are the pancakes that I just made right now. Definitely not this morning. And the final step, don't forget your favorite topping, Nutella. Top it off, hazelnuts, roasted. See, these pancakes, they're not just delicious, but also the perfect analogy for algorithms and data structures. The ingredients become our data, while the bowl and the pan become the data structures, where the data is stored and manipulated by the algorithm. Essentially, data structures are building blocks that algorithms operate on. So to help you understand these concepts, I drew this beautiful drawing. And if you're asking, why the hell is the pancake batter orange? It is because I didn't have any pancake colored markers, so shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh... Please subscribe. Anyways, the pan, it's a data structure. And inside of the pan, there is some pancake batter, which is another data structure. And this data structure, it is made up of a list of ingredients, which is yet another data structure. And these data structures, they each have some properties. These properties, they are of a certain data type. Heat is an integer, is empty is a boolean, and batter is of type batter. But there is a difference here. Integer and boolean, are so-called primitive data type. That means that they are not made up of any other data types. So they are as primitive as it gets. Better on the other hand, it is a data structure that we have to define ourselves. And it is made up of, as you see here, a Boolean, which is a primitive data type, and the list of ingredients, which is a list of data structures. So the way I want you to think about data types and data structures is just like atoms and molecules, you know, Atoms are the smallest things in the universe and molecules are made up of many smaller atoms and sometimes also other molecules. And with that, you should now know how pancakes relate to data structures. Consider this function. The two numbers are data types of the type integer. If we put the two integers together like this, we have created a data structure called an array. Arrays store a collection of elements, usually of the same type. Each element in an array is assigned a unique index, which can be used to access and modify the value stored at that location. Arrays are useful for storing a sequence of elements that you want to iterate over and process. There are also other interesting data structures, such as stacks and queues. Pancakes are a perfect analogy of the stack data structure. When you have a stack of pancakes, you must take the one from the top first before you can access the ones below. You can also put new pancakes on top, but not in the middle and not in the bottom. When you add an item to the top, that operation is called push. And when you take an item, it is called pop. Remember, you can only put and take things from the top. And that is why in computer science, we categorize a stack as a first in, last out data structure. A related yet opposite data structure is a queue. Instead of a vertical stack, envision a horizontal queue. It has the same two properties where an item can go in and one can go out but the operations are now called enqueue and dequeue. The rules are different. When you enqueue an item, it enters the queue from the left 
and when you DQ an item, you do it from the right side. So it is a first in, first out data structure, the exact opposite of a stack. You will need either of these structures for different problems. So that is why it is useful to know the existence of both. There are also graphs and trees, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. These are more complex and very powerful. They are directly linked with beating the world champion in chess, as we will discuss later in the video. So now that you know the basics of data structures, we are ready to tackle algorithms. A pancake recipe is actually an algorithm, a series of steps that when followed exactly as outlined, give us a predictable result, our fluffy golden stack of pancakes. In computer science, the definition is very similar, a finite series of unambiguous steps to solve a problem or complete a task. The algorithm is made of a set of inputs, some logic and an output. The logic operates on the input and outputs the result. The result can then alter the flow of our program or be used as the input for the next function in our code. The flow of a program is governed by so-called control flow statements. Let's break down what that means. So a computer program is made of lines of code. A statement is a line of code. The flow is typically executing the first line and then the next one and so on until all lines have been executed in sequential order. But special control flow statements change how a program is executed. If else statements divide the flow into two paths. Path one is an if statement. If statements are used to execute blocks of code only if a condition is true. Path two is an else statement. Else statements are used in conjunction with an if statement to specify a block of code that should be executed when the condition of the if statement is false. If and else statements control the flow of the programming, they are also called conditional statements. Control flow statements also include looping statements. One looping statement is a for each loop. Another looping statement is a while loop. For each loops, iterate through a list of items and execute the same lines of code for each item. The basic idea of a for each loop is to provide a way to iterate through the collection and execute a block of code for each item that is inside of the collection. While loops execute the same lines of code again and again until a condition is met. While loops are useful when you want to repeatedly execute a block of code based on a condition that can change during the loop's execution. These are commonly used when the number of iterations is not known in advance or when you want to repeatedly perform some action until a certain condition is met. With an understanding of these basic building blocks, you can come up with infinite amount of algorithms and essentially build any app. That is why these concepts are so important and luckily they are very simple too. Now let's linger a bit on the unambiguity of algorithms, as it is one of the most important characteristics. It is also where a cooking recipe sometimes differs from a computer algorithm. In the pancake scene, I told you to use a pinch of salt. A pinch is an ambiguous term. It is not an exact amount of salt and it differs from pinch to pinch. While it is not important for recipes, it is a no-go for computers. They need to know exactly how much of what to put where and exactly how to do it. But we are not just interested in getting to the end result, we are also interested in how efficiently we can get there. We will discuss that shortly, but first I need to suit up because we have a party to attend. There is an algorithm hidden in this party, see if you can recognize it. Hold on sir. Name please. Huge Jackman. Do you mean Hugh Jackman? That is what I said. Huge Jackman. Whatever, man. Uh, it's right here. Hey, Mr. Huge Jackman. Thank you. Hold on. We do have a dress code. Not again. Did you notice the algorithm? If you set the guard searching the list of names, 
you're correct. The algorithm he used is called binary search. It allowed him to significantly reduce the number of comparisons he did. Binary search falls into a category of algorithms called divide and conquer. Divide and conquer algorithms divide one very large task into a few much smaller tasks. And in this way, they are eliminating many possibilities at each step. Then they can work their way back through the sub solutions into the overall solution. Divide and conquer, splitting up the problem, then conquering the small parts one at a time until the whole solution is problem. <laughs> Until the whole solution is problemed. No, I mean, until the whole problem is solved. Alternatively, the bouncer could have went through the names one by one, starting from the beginning of the list and stopping when he finds the name. This is another category of algorithms called brute force. The advantage of brute force algorithms is that they are simple and they're also easy to understand and implement. They are actually useful and very common in real application when the task is small, but when the problem gets large, brute force algorithms crumble to dust and they are unable to provide a practical answer in a useful amount of time. Had the bouncer brute forced the list, he would have made 21 comparisons before finding the answer. But because he used the binary search algorithm, he did it with just 4 comparisons. He started with Justin Bieber, moved on to Walt Disney, then Finger Me, uh, I mean Finger Me, and finally it led him to Huge Jackman. Saving 17 comparisons is meaningless when a computer can do a thousand in a second. But imagine if the input size was a billion names. This is the scale of the data computers actually traverse in real applications. The difference between brute forcing and using binary search in that regard is a billion comparisons versus like uh, 28 comparisons. However, it only works with sorted lists and this is how. Start with a sorted list of items and let's call the whole thing your search space. Look at the element at the exact middle of your search space and compare it to what you're looking for. If it is your answer, return it as the result. If not, the result is either to the left side of the current item or the right side. If it is on the left side, discard all the elements to the right and use the left side of the list as your new search space. Now look in the middle of this new list that is half the size of the original and repeat until you found your answer. So with binary search, you eliminate half the list at each step and if the list is very big, it can mean billions of eliminations per step. But if you brute force, you eliminate just one element at a time. Do you see how powerful the right algorithm is? This is why I preach to learn this stuff before getting too deep into specific frameworks, languages and tools. Master the concepts I'm teaching you here and you will be years ahead of other self-taught programmers. Now with this in mind, let's learn the practical steps to analyze the performance of an algorithm and how to go about optimizing it. That's where we start talking about the very important concepts of time and space complexity. Remember when we discussed the anatomy of an algorithm earlier and it was made up of an input, some logic and an output? Well, the logic takes time to run and the input is closely related to how long that takes. We call the relationship time complexity. It helps us understand how the algorithm's runtime is affected as the size of the input grows. Space complexity is another related term, so we have time complexity and space complexity. Usually we are mostly concerned with time complexity, so just forget about space complexity for now. To measure these complexities, we use big O notation. The O stands for order of, and it helps us estimate the worst case scenario for time or space requirements of an algorithm. For example, an algorithm with a time complexity of O of N will have its runtime grow linearly with the size of the input data. We saw this with the brute force algorithm before. If the input list grows with one element, it takes one more computation to get to the answer. An algorithm that grows with a time complexity of O of N squared will grow exponentially slower as the input size grows. If your input grew by 100 elements, the algorithm would have to do around 10,000 additional comparisons to get to the answer. If your list had a billion entries, the sun would burn out and the universe would collapse onto itself before your computer gave you an answer. If you find yourself in this situation, think hard and deep about how to optimize. The five main big O functions you'll see are the following. O of n, O of log n, O of n, O of n log n, and O of n squared. Each represents a different rate of growth and knowing these will help you understand the efficiency of an algorithm. My goal here is to introduce them to you, but not to bore you with the details. Subscribe for a deep dive video that I have coming up on the topic if you want to actually understand them and take a deep dive and become a great developer in the process. For now though, 
Just remember that the ones to the left are much better than the ones to the right. If you can shift your algorithm one step to the left, you've made a massive improvement. If you can harness the big O functions and learn to be intuitive about it when programming, you'll be ahead of most developers. Now, I want to show you something much cooler. How IBM's supercomputer called Deep Blue defeated the chess world champion Gary Kasparov in the 90s.